everyone. Today, we are, our dialogue is on generational family. And we are very fortunate to have with us today, both Corny and Cindy Lawrence. And um, we have been friends for, gosh, I don't even know how many years, probably 25, 30 years at least. At least. Uh, and so, you know, Corny is, is uh, I'm going to, let's see, he's a husband, a dad, a deacon, Poppy. Is that how you call it, Poppy? Yeah, Poppy. Uh, he was born uh, in Houston in 1955, and he's a graduate of Mount Carmel High School here, in, that is no longer here, but um, in 1973. He married his wife, Cindy Stelly, in uh, 1976. They have three children, two boys and one girl, seven grandchildren, two daughters-in-law, one son-in-law, and Corny was ordained to the diaconate in 1994, and he's currently assigned to St. Justin Martyr, uh, where, where they've been parishioners for over 38 years, long time. Um, he's retired from the United States Postal Service after 35 years with them. Now, Cindy, Cindy's a wife, a mother, mama. She was born in Galena Park, Texas, and she's a graduate of Incarnate Word. Academy uh, in 1975. Uh, she was, that's where we met, was at Straight Jesuit when she worked with the principal at the time. And she's retired after 20 years at Straight Jesuit. Now, some of you I've met before on one of the, the different uh, dialogues, but I'm a mom, a wife. Uh, I'm um, also a mother in law, and I have 10 sons and seven, six, excuse me, six still, daughters-in-law, 20 grandchildren. Uh, my grandchildren call me Baba, and that was the name given me by my oldest granddaughter here in Houston. Um, Joe and I have been married for 47 years, and I am blessed still to have my parents alive, 94 and 95, but they live up in Northern Virginia. So, as we get started today, we want to kind of share a little bit about our backgrounds. You know, I come from an Irish Italian background. My husband is of Mexican and Spanish background. And so we bring all of those cultures to our marriage, to our families over the generations. And now that I have, you know, six daughters in law, we're also bringing their cultures and their traditions into our family. So, um, Cindy, Corny, I don't know which one of you want to start, but why don't you share a little bit about your background? Well, uh, uh, ladies first. <laughs> okay, ladies first. <laughs> um, I come from a Creole family. My parents were born and raised in Appaloosas, Louisiana, which is right outside of Lafayette. Uh, my dad came to Texas in 1954. Uh, to get a job. And I'm the only Texan in the family. My brother was born in Louisiana, and I was born here in Galena Park. Um, family for me is, I don't know, it's everything. And uh, because of the Creole background, uh, a close tight-knit family uh, is what I'm used to and what I'm most comfortable with. I only have one brother, uh, my parents are both now deceased. Um, my dad died in 2012 of gastric cancer, and my mom died two years later of renal failure. So uh, it's just my brother and I, and uh, I cherish him dearly. He just turned 69 on the 13th of March. So uh, hope to keep him around a little longer. Uh, Corny? Well, I can uh, can say that we have one major thing in common, Cindy and I, is that we're both from Creole families. And so to say, okay, if you say, well, Creole is made up of what? A little bit of everything. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, anybody from the Creole uh, generational families of Louisiana can't put a finger on any dominant culture bunch of it but anyway uh but what you know differs is that my family is from north louisiana okay and of course they tell you in louisiana anything north of alexandria is yankee country you know and so 
So my Creole family, being of North Louisiana, uh, my parents were both born up in the Natchitoches area. I uh, was born here in Houston, where six of my seven siblings, if you will, to seven of us, uh, six of us were born here. My oldest brother was born in Louisiana. And so, yeah, we're Texans, big family. So as opposed to Cindy with only two in her family, it was seven of us children. You know, when we sat down to the table, there was nine of us. And so, yeah, large family, not quite as, as large as, as Kathy and Joe with theirs, but uh, pretty big, pretty big. And so uh, what my experiences were growing up were a little different from Cindy's in the sense that, yeah, big family, small family, okay? Uh, Cindy's mom and dad both worked always. My mom stayed home a lot until it was necessary for her to get out to get away from the seven kids and get a job. <laughs> and so she got a job later on when the uh, when my baby sister got old enough. But uh, but yes, a very uh, large but very religious family. Yes, we're all Catholics. Cindy's family, my family. All of us can identify ourselves as Catholics, and that's one thing in our background that hasn't changed. Okay. What was so, the, what was maybe the biggest kind of um, difference that you found after you got married? Uh, well, I would have to say that uh, it was hard for me to relate at times to Cindy's small family because uh, we we tended to appreciate a whole lot of, for lack of a better description, what we didn't have, okay? There was a lot we didn't have and a lot that we had to, to share in a very special way, you know? And Cindy has shared to me where with her family, well, no, it wasn't that way. You know, we, we were, you know, we, we pretty much had what we wanted and not just what we needed. And, you know, and not being bad or anything, that was just different, it's that just was just different. Yeah. Yeah, it was very difficult when yeah. we first got married. Um, with me coming from a small family, I'm the youngest. I'm the only girl. Uh, so I, as Corny would say, I was spoiled. Uh, <laughs> I was daddy's baby. And, um, and so I didn't grow up with having to share my things with anybody. What I had was mine. And, um, and what my brother had was his. There are four years difference between us. So for, you know, for a small family, four years is, is huge. Uh, you know, he was doing things way before I was. And so being a boy, there was not a whole lot in common that we had to share. Uh, you know, we played together, but, you know, that was only because I forced him to play dolls. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, when we got married, um, I remember one of our very first holidays, our very first Christmas after our, our son was born, Corny and I just were, we were at odds because I wanted to buy everything that this child could possibly want. Um, he was only, what, a year, year and a half. And, uh, and Corny kept telling me, no, he only, get, he only needs two things. And I'm like, what do you mean, two things, you know? And so we had to come to, uh, to a compromise. We, I had to learn to appreciate where he came from and his large family. And I think he grew to appreciate where I came from because it was a struggle for me. You know, I, I don't know about big families. See, Joe and I, I mean, our, our challenge was, I grew up in a family of five girls. And um, of course we were chit chat all the time. We shared everything. We were close in age, except for the, the youngest sister. Um, Joe grew up with a younger brother, a younger sister. A sister was um, seven years younger than than he was. Um, so our communication styles were a little different. You know, um, when he, I got home, I was teaching first grade at the time. When we first got married, Joe was doing a, his internship and residency in pediatrics at Baylor. And, uh, you know, he came home and he kind of just kind of wanted to not not have too much interaction where I was ready to just talk, 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 talk. And, um, and that increased somewhat 
after we started our family and I was home um, and I needed kind of an adult to talk to. Um, and so, yeah, and, and then our cultures were different, you know, um, the Irish and Italian are very, um, well, we both, they, my parents grew up in big families. And so I was used to large interactions. Joe was too in that his mom grew up in a, in a large family, but they, his dad didn't really like interacting with that large family sometimes. And so they, <clears throat> they often distanced themselves from the Pratt side of the, the family. Um, and we, and we kind of saw that in our relationship as, as in-laws um, to see the different communication skills, the different set of, of expectations that my parents had over his parents. And, um, and so there, yeah, there's, there's that kind of um, growing together and learning a new way. Um, and now we see that with our, our, our own sons as they've gotten married and, and they bring in their daughters-in-law and their families. Um, as I'm sure you see with, with your children who have married and are now your in-laws. Right, right. And it's funny that you say that, Kathy, because um, looking, you know, looking, reflecting back, Corny's mom, her family situation was very similar to mine. She was the only girl in a small family. There were only three total siblings in her family. But Corny's dad was like Corny and had a huge family. And so it's kind of funny how those things are, you know, kind of prominent in both of our families. Um, we also had to figure out how to navigate holidays and you know, celebrations and all of those things. And, you know, Corny's father was a mailman. So like Corny, you know, he had one off day that the family shared together and that was Sunday. Otherwise there was a rotating off day during the week. Uh, my dad worked all the time, but for the most part, he was home on the weekends. My mom was a school teacher. So I was with my mom every day all day until I went to high school and um, talk about togetherness. <laughs> A lot of togetherness. <laughs> it's true. And, and you, and so you learn to, to kind of adapt with that. I mean, the boys grew up seeing Joe's long hours and yet um, now to see how committed they are, they saw how Joe gave so much to the family and was there for them, participated and shared in their experiences. And, and so now it's fun for me to see them doing the same with their children, um, you know, and, and with their wives. I mean, we, we are very touched when we see them, you know, very much sharing in the, the housework and the chores and the responsibilities, you know, it, it's really been wonderful to see that um, evolve down to their, their lives and setting the example now for their children going forward. And we see some of that also with our kids. You know, we, we get to look at how they've raised their children and said, you know, okay, well, I think they picked something up from us, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and those things that they haven't picked up from us, well, okay, well, we pray on those, you know? <laughs> but, but, for the, but for the most part, yeah. Uh, we can appreciate what they have picked up. Mm -hmm. And in, in retrospect, I look back and says, well, I picked up some of that from my parents, Cindy from hers, uh, my parents from my grandparents. And so I can see, you know, throughout the generations, how some things haven't changed. You know, some things have remained. Uh, you know, first and foremost, our faith, obviously, but then our cultural peculiarities, if you will. Okay. Cindy and I came from two different areas of Louisiana, yes, but we ended up in the same neighborhood. Okay. When we were kids, Cindy and I ended up in the same parish, in the same school, and we ended up in the same classroom when I was in the kindergarten. You know, she kind of jumped in there with her mom because her mom was my teacher. <laughs> oh, so, how amazing. So it was one of those things where, yeah, we've been together, 
you know, most of our lives because we were teeny, teeny kids. And, uh, and so our cultures and our faith, you know, literally brought us together. And so we can see that being passed on to our children for the most part in a very, you know, very special way. And I think one of the gifts, you know, we've given our sons, and kind of as you're speaking of that, you know, because Joe came from a background, his mom was from Barcelona, Spain, and dad from Mexico. Um, I have to tell you, I never had Mexican food until I met Joe in New Orleans. Our first, our first date, and we laugh now, um, was to a Mexican restaurant in New Orleans, you know, <laughs> I was like, really? Oh, well. Uh, Oh my gosh, we had we had more fun though. Um, the waitress was as tall as she was wide. Um, <laughs> lipstick covered half her face, and we had no idea what to order. So Joe would tell her, and she literally would yell it to the kitchen. Um, it was it was it was a lot of fun. And of course, then I'm Irish Italian, and I saw the blending of that those two cultures with my parents. Um, it was beautiful. Um, we always laugh because the Irish side of the family, mom's family, was always included when the Italian, the Musco family, had a celebration, and we were the only, usually the only in-law family that was included. Um, and then we could see the competition at my, my parents' 25th uh, wedding anniversary. It was up, held by one of my uncles up in Hartford, Connecticut. And the Italians decided to, to challenge the Irish family, Irish men in the family, really, to a bocce tournament. And the Irish won. <laughs> and um, and my, my Irish uncles never, never let it down. But, you know, we see that now as our family, we have different cultures and different um, kind of traditions that, that the girls are bringing in, into the family. Um, we, uh, you know, it's just, it's just a fun thing to kind of grow and expand and, and learn about what we're doing. And then just one more comment, uh, you know, you're talking about traditions in Christmas. We, I was very fortunate because it was actually one of my daughters-in-law who said, you know what, the boys and the family need to be together at, and know every other year we're gonna be together. So every other Christmas is the Garcia Press Christmas. And then the other year is the in-laws. And, you know, it just got established from the beginning and everyone that comes into the family, that's kind of how it is. Yeah. You, you well, just, we had yeah. to um, modify our Christmas celebrations um, because after the boys got married, the one thing that I didn't want to do was cause, uh, cause them difficulty in having to choose what part of the day they were going to spend with me and our family and what part of the day they would be with their, their spouse and their family. And so I just made an executive decision and I said, we will celebrate Christmas whenever we can all be together because Celia was in Louisiana and so she would have to travel and um, and I wanted her to develop family traditions here with her children and not necessarily being on the road trying to get to mama and poppy before Santa you know so um, so now Christmas celebrations for us is usually a couple of days after Christmas Day, uh, just to give everybody the opportunity to do what they need to do without feeling pressured or rushed. Um, I just didn't want to cause that confusion with the kids, and uh, and it's worked out for the most part. It's it's difficult because it's a change from what we had always had, but you know you love your kids enough to where you're willing to sacrifice whatever you need for their well-being and, and their benefit. And so it, it's kind of it's kind of working out okay. So what do you see as some of the um, challenges, I guess you could say, or differences that you faced raising your children and my me, mine, who were relatively same ages, probably had a little bit more and maybe a greater span. Um, but that our our children now are in raising their children are facing. Um, because it is different. It's a different world um, from the, the 70s and 80s and early 90s than it is now in, in 2020. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you know, if Cindy and I were to look back, say for instance, starting in the '60s with our own families, what we experienced, unfortunately, because of who we are, we we experience some racism. You know, probably not uh, purposely. You know, but it was what it was, which is why we ended up in the same parish because there weren't a lot of churches that were lovingly, openly to, okay, our cultures. And so uh, we grew up with, with that factor, but it brought us together. But we, so we did have a place to worship. We did have a place comfortable, okay? But when we had our kids, okay, obviously, you know, we're talking, uh, early, I mean, sorry, mid seventies, well then, yeah, we're talking about a different generation. We're talking about a different uh, culture, maybe some advancements, obviously. And so we were able to move into a neighborhood that was, you know, multicultural. We were able to go to a church that was primarily Anglo, but now it's very multicultural. But what we were able to get through, I think our children benefit from, you know, and so uh, we 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 see we see something you know very much blossoming you know because of that, yeah. And see, we because Joe is of of a Hispanic background. Um, when I first got married, never thought anything of him being of, of Mexican or Spanish uh, descent none whatsoever. I had grown up around the world. My dad was in the Navy. And so I literally, you know, I lived in Morocco. I lived in Spain, um, went to school with integrated um, situations most of my time until we were really in the States. And then you never, you never saw, saw an integration except one young lady was a freshman in African-American young girl in Jacksonville, Florida, Bishop Kenny, only one. Um, and so anyway, I thought nothing of it, you know, being married to Joe till I came here to Texas and, uh, I faced it with the first week I was married when I went to get my driver's license and had a name like Garcia Prats and the, uh, officer at the time, he told me I would be very smart to drop the Garcia. And use <laughs> Prats. Um, so I actually asked, offered to put Jones on there and he's looking, what's Jones? I said, it's not my name either. Yeah. Well, he required me to go get all the documentation that that was my name. Um, and then we saw that, I saw that over the years in different ways um, because we're very fair skinned, picked up much more of Joe's uh, mother's side of the family probably. Um, there, you didn't see the connection in the same way. But, but we did see that. And now our family is very multicultural. Um, our children have adopted children of color. And, you know, with the recent, you know, Black Lives Matter, um, it became very, very in front of them of what their children may have to experience growing up. Um, so, yeah. Well, our children, our, our children as well, um, we have biracial grandchildren. Uh, Two of our in-laws are Anglo, and um, our son Chris married um, a girl that went to our parish, and so we've known her family forever. Um, Celia came to New Orleans to go to school, and ended up finding her husband here, and um, and so our children are biracial. They look more Anglo, uh, especially Celia's children. Uh, Chris's children look more Hispanic than Black or Anglo, so so the blending just kind of worked out. <laughs> but you know, I see here in Louisiana the struggle that my grandchildren are having with identifying with being Black because they don't look Black, and so they're having uh, we're having conversations while I'm here with them about their African-American heritage, their Black African-American heritage, and the pride that's associated with that. And, um, but at the same time, not negating 
their Anglo side of the family because you never want to do that, you know. And so, um, so it's it, it's it's beautiful to see that what we were able to do with putting our kids in a diverse environment help them to see people fall in love and build their own family of a diverse culture. And uh, see the friendships, you know, um, we, we were very fortunate. Um, we've been in our home for 40 plus years and uh, an African-American family moved into the neighborhood and the two sons were the same age as our youngest two. And um, I remember we went to see the, the movie, remember the Titans? Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, coming home, we started talking about the movie a little bit. And I actually lived in Northern Virginia when that, that whole episode happened. Um, so very, it was very familiar to me. And I mentioned that, you know, that growing up, you didn't intermingle. Uh, it was rare for the, the, for the neighborhood to be multicultural, a little bit more up in Northern Virginia because of the diversity of diplomats and different cultures. But I remember, you know, one of the boys said, oh my gosh, how sad that would be. Because I said, well, you probably wouldn't have had them in our neighborhood to play with. And, mm -hmm. uh, and one of them said, oh, how sad that would be. Mm -hmm. uh, because they were such dear friends, still are. They're, yeah. you know, uh, Jamie was in one of the weddings and they're just good friends. And right. for me, that's just been a gift that we, we give our children. And hopefully, um, it will, it will, it will trickle down through these next generations. But Corny, how do you see it within, with your work as a, as a deacon in the church and blending cultures and faiths and all of these things we, we deal with? Well, yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I think I take comfort in, in remembering, you know, cause I like to refer to scripture all the time, obviously, if I wouldn't, uh, I think the card will take my little ID card away. But anyway, <laughs> I look at scripture and especially St. Paul's letters reminding, I'm sorry, Christ didn't come just these people here. Yes, he came among these people, but it was for the whole world. You know, so the last words that Christ left with his, you know, apostles were go out into the world. He didn't say, go back around the corner you know, and take care of business there uh, and don't worry about the rest of the world. No, it's for the world. And so to see how, especially at St. Justin, how our parish has become almost as if it's, it's a snapshot of the world at times, you know, it's so multicultural. I think that's our, you know, our way of listening to what God has to say. So it's like, okay, yeah, this is for God's people. And some of them are Nigerians. Some are Vietnamese. Some are Filipinos. They're from all over the world. Okay. And so we have to be able to say uh, all God's children deserve what we know God wants them to have. And so to see where we've, where we've come Say that yeah, we still have a long way to go, but we have an opportunity to also bring that, if you will, gospel into the world through these many, many cultures, diverse cultures. Uh, and so, in in my work, I see that I, I have I have I have a tremendous opportunity, you know. And shame on me if I don't take you know advantage of it, you know. And so I, I'm blessed to see what I do have in front of me. And the impact you have on individuals. I know we had shared um, when we were visiting earlier, your story with a young man who you had baptized. Can you, right. would you share that story? And just how important it is for us to realize that we have an impact on people that we may not even realize. Right. Not well, only our children. Yeah. As Kathy mentioned earlier, yeah, I was I was ordained back in '94, and so for 20 over 26 years, I've been a deacon, and of course, done a lot. Baptism has always been my favorite of all the ministries I've done, and so you know, uh, I I put I put my soul into it, and so uh, a couple of years ago, a young man came up to me, 
uh, I think it was after one of our uh, uh, services at church. And he says, uh, Deacon Corner, you may not recognize me, but you baptized me. I said, yeah, you're right. I wouldn't recognize you because you were probably six months old at the time. And so he said, uh, my mom talks about you all the time. And so what that told me was that, yes, as Kathy mentioned, I had some sort of impact on his mom and family. And then she obviously shared that with him. And so I get to see not just the fruits of my labor, you know, of what I've done in the ministry as a deacon, but I've, I've seen what, you know, my personal impact may have had, but I've also seen where our shape, our faith has been shared uh, through, through more generations. And so the mom is sharing with her son and her son is, is starting to share that with me and of course those around him. And so it's like, wow, you know, uh, I guess if I hang around in this ministry long enough, you know, things like this will continue to happen, you know, and that was truly a blessing. Yeah. It's true. You know, I had something happen recently. Um, you know, it was, it was actually a Facebook kind of share and a mother um, was sharing that her daughter had gotten, was accepted into St. Agnes. Well, our oldest granddaughter has just been accepted as well. Well, this mom was someone that I had, um, that had come to one of my presentations when I'm not even sure she had this child at the time. I think her, her children, she has two daughters, they were both adopted. Um, I think she had the, the older one, but not the younger one. And I remember after the talk, she actually connected with me and just thanked me for um, what I had said during that presentation. That kind of gave her a little bit of encouragement as a mom, a new mom, and um, so to kind of reconnect at this time, and I, I kind of just sent her something, just said, Con congratulations, my granddaughter will be there as well, and hopefully our paths will cross again. Um, and she says, well, I, while I haven't seen you, I think of you. Um, I've thought of you over the years. And so sometimes we don't realize that the impact we have on them, but also on now on our grandchildren. Um, you know, Cindy, I know, you know, you're there now with your grandchildren and, yeah. um, you know, it's, it's important that we, we kind of help them along and guide them as well. Yes, it is. And um, I've been blessed to be here with, with the family for the last three weeks and um, still have a couple more weeks to go. Um, but in a lot of ways, it has reminded me of the time that I spent with my own grandmother um, in the summers. I had, because my mom taught school, she also taught summer school. And traditionally, uh, my brother and I would be sent to Louisiana to stay with our grandmother while my mom worked. And because back in the 60s, there was no such thing as daycare. <laughs> there was, uh, you know, you stayed with an aunt or a relative. And my brother who had been born in Louisiana loved to come back to Louisiana. I, on the other hand, didn't love it so much. Um, it was the country and, and it was dark and it was strange and they drank milk out of a cow and not out of a <laughs> red and white box like we did, you know? And so I would come, but as I got older, I begin to do things with my grandmother and uh, she taught me how to sew and I would watch her bake and, you know, I'd help in the kitchen and I just wanted to be like her. There was something about my grandmother that just, you know, I was like, there was this connection. Uh, she was different from my mom. My grandmother was a housewife. My mom was a career woman. So my mom didn't do baking. My mom her baking was going to the grocery store and picking up a cake and bringing it home. My grandmother, on the other hand, would stay up all night baking for the church, you know, Sunday after mass sale. And, um, and I loved doing that. Uh, she, she was a wonderful cook and I would watch her cook. So when I became a grandmother, I wanted to be like my grandmother. And that's why I have the name Mama because that was what I called my grandmother. And so I insisted that my kids would call, my grandkids would call me that. Um, so, you know, it's that 
having that ability to impact my grandkids. Uh, Chloe and I are baking muffins on Saturday morning and Brighton and I are sharing jokes and stories and all of the hugs that I can possibly give them because this is the first time that I've had this long with them and I want to make the most of it. You know, if something were to happen to me today, God forbid, I want my grandkids to have memories of the time that they spent with me, like I had of spending time with my grandmother. And it also brings up that whole, you know, you're there supporting your, your daughter and her family through one of these challenges that we have. And I think that's something that I have been extremely grateful for, um, you know, with my, my mom, especially uh, being able to come down and help me out, um, help us out. You know, she, she was here for every one of the boys following their delivery, some of them prior to as, as we, we grew and she knew she needed to be here before I had the baby. Um, but I've had major eye issues over the years and um, she gave up, she was working at the time, but literally was here for almost a month um, to take care of what at the time was a three month old and a 15 month old, which isn't easy. And then trying to drive around in a, a stick shift Volkswagen um, <laughs> come visit me in the hospital. So, um, you know, but having that support and for the boys to see um, that support and, and the love that came with it are, are just a gift. And I saw it with my dad as well, you know, um, they developed that, those relationships with them. And, you know, here they are in their, their older age, mom's memory is, is fading and, um, you know, they're both 94, 95. But it's still a joy for, for them to Skype together, FaceTime together. You know, the boys um, and my dad, they, they connect. Um, and it's just, it's just a gift. And, and we see that. And I want the, the grandchildren to, to see how important it is for, uh, for us as families to be there with, with the differences that we have. But I, I always use the, the phrase, you know, it, we can't let our differences tear us apart. Um, they need to build us up. You know, Joe and I grew up in two different families, different communication skills, different backgrounds. Um, you know, Joe's much more on the scientific side in medicine. I was a first grade teacher, much more into the literary world and things. Um, but if we were exactly the same, we'd have a lot of gaps to fill. And, and we see that with our boys, you know, how different they are, how similar they are, how close they are, but that they respected and built up each, each other um, in spite of their differences. Um, and so as we, as we do this, even, even with faith issues, you know, some of our, you know, we have now different faiths within our, within our family and the respect that we, we must show each other um, in who and what we are. Um, I think I'm sure, you know, Corny, you see that with, with marriage prep, which we oh, did yeah. when we did marriage prep. Right, exactly, yeah. Uh, and in a way, there's no bigger blessing, but there's also no bigger challenge. Yeah. <laughs> because it, cause it is a challenge, you know. And uh, that's the first thing, you know, I address with those couples that I'm uh, preparing, especially when you have someone from a Buddhist culture marrying someone in the Catholic tradition, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of hope there, you know, especially of conversion. But it, it was easy for me to do in a lot of ways when I look back at not only the family I grew up in, you know, but we were all Catholic, but we grew up in a neighborhood where we as Catholics were the minority, okay? Even though our, our church was just two blocks away, we walked. Okay, we all came from this same area of Louisiana in this parish. And so we were like this, this little group of Roman Catholic Creoles here amongst Fifth Ward, okay, which was primarily Black, but some Hispanics. But we had, we had a challenge, okay, but we did, uh, obviously with the grace of God, not only survive, but we were able to uh, see a lot of conversions. Yeah. My father was godfather for a lot of guys in the neighborhood because they looked at him as someone 
who provided. And so he had them convert and he became the godfather, things like that. Okay. And so when I was able to bring that into my own family uh, with my children, I saw the impact that that had on them. And of course, the people they married. Well, two of them were already Catholic. One was not. He thought he was Catholic. <laughs> he, grew up in, he grew up in a Lutheran uh, household, even though his dad was Catholic, his mom was not. Uh, you know, he grew up, he was baptized as a Lutheran. Well, as growing up, well, he just thought he was Catholic because he'd go to Catholic church sometimes, sometimes Lutheran church, but most of the time Catholic church, Catholic school. And he went to Catholic all schools. Through, all throughout his life, he went to Catholic schools. And so he knew as much about the Catholic church as any Catholic, okay? And so when he met Celia, he started going to church with her and it's like, okay, well, you know, yes, uh, okay. It's time to go to communion and Celia says later, what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yes. well, going to communion. well okay well you technically you're not catholic well i thought i was you know that kind of thing and so <laughs> but he, he he officially converted later on and and because he wanted to he wanted to immediately as soon as he could okay and so all of that says that the the influence of my growing up with our faith what i shared with my children what they share with their spouses and now with their children uh, is not just a blessing, but it's the grace of God. It is. And you know, one of the things, I mean, we, it's fun because I, I love being with you all. You, you always laugh when, when you're with you. And so can you think of a funny story maybe that, um, that you might want to share that's kind of, with your grandchildren, your parents. Um, you know, I, I can start, it, it's just coming off and it, it kind of has to do with um, sometimes the new technologies that are out there. And um, I remember early on, I had my phone and you know, you have to put your little, I had to put my little passcode in. Um, this was quite a few, few years back. And um, anyway, then I put my phone down and a little while later, I, I saw one of my granddaughters playing with my phone. And, you know, and, and her dad said, you know, what are you, where, what are you doing? Um, were you allowed to do that? And of course, you know, she got that, that little stare and I'm looking and I'm thinking, what did she do? How did she get on that? Well, you know, she had watched me put my passcode in um, and, you know, I can laugh about it, but it was also a lesson on being honest and asking permission and what's right to do and what's not not right to do um but we can laugh about it now because i do i need her to help me with my my phone and computer and things like that so uh, we've kind of come full circle yeah well uh kind of a funny story with with us is that uh when uh our last grandchild was born well, we look back from when my daughter-in-law got pregnant and we were excited because at the time there was a three-way tie, three boys and three girls, okay? And so it's <laughs> like, okay, this one is going to break the tie. We didn't know at the time, boy or girl, but it was going to be number seven that was going to break the tie of our grandchildren. And, uh, and so, we recall one of our favorite TV shows uh, about how an episode was that someone said they thought the name, they always wanted to name their child was Seven. <laughs> and, and so while my daughter-in-law was pregnant, the baby's name was Seven. <laughs> and so we called her and say, well, how is Seven doing today? You know, <laughs> and so we all laugh and joke about that. Well, when it got to be where we found out it was going to be a girl, well, when she was born, obviously, she was a girl because we didn't know beforehand. It was like, okay, she broke the tie. It's a girl. But I'll always look back, and, and we all have to joke about this, that, yeah, number seven in a lot of ways meant the world to us. Not just because she broke the tie, but because <laughs> what she did was give us an 
an inkling into, I think, what God has in store for us. And, 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 you know, we're resolved now that this could be, the, you know, this could be it for us. This could be all of our grandchildren, okay? And number seven holds a special place in our hearts, always will. But yeah. we can laugh and joke about that, you know, because my daughter-in-law, well, seven was not going to be the name, but, you know, <laughs> but that was a beautiful way of looking at how we felt about her. And so today, Corinne, that's her real name. <laughs> It is a beautiful, and she's a reminder of that, you know, God gives us what we need in his own time. Absolutely. Yeah. Cindy, do you have one? Well, you know, <laughs> I think one of the funniest things had happened recently um, here in, in Louisiana. Uh, my granddaughter has her iPad, and she FaceTimed with Corny. Well... Celia had put in the wrong phone number, so there was no telling who Chloe was calling, but <laughs> whoever she tried to FaceTime with didn't respond. When we finally realized what had happened and we were able to FaceTime with him, Chloe had lost interest, so she secretly blocked Poppy. <gasps> Her iPad, he's Mr. Pops. So Mr. Pops kept trying to call FaceTime, and we couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. <laughs> well, when we got to the iPad, she had gotten frustrated because he had not answered her before, so she blocked him. <laughs> and I was like, how did she do that? <laughs> and Celia so said, Mom, this child can do anything on this iPad. You would not believe. And she can. I mean, she is. these kids are so technologically savvy. You know, whereas I'm trying to figure out how to do things every day, all day, you know. Well, we got Mr. Pops unblocked and we were able to FaceTime him on Sunday. And, <laughs> and she she even participated. <laughs> so. so that reminds me of a news story that happened a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, with so many virtual classes, this young girl, I don't know how what grade she was in. She was young, maybe third, fourth, fifth grade, somewhere in there. And um, so she went to log on one day and whether she did it on purpose the first time or not, it, she got the wrong password in and it kicked her out. And uh, she thought, oh, gee, well, she kept putting in the wrong password, oh, password. <laughs> for days until <laughs> someone connected with the parents. And of course she got in. She, she had a little discipline to deal with and she wouldn't recommend it. She said, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. The consequences were too great, but right. you know, these, yeah, there are new challenges. You know, right. I didn't have to worry about what was on the cell phone when, when my boys, they were just literally, my younger boys were just coming into that era. Our first computer was when Timmy was a baby, which is 93. Um, right. And so, you know, I remember he was just a, a little guy. Joe was still holding him when we had our first computer. Um, and you didn't, so you didn't have some of the challenges you do now. And now they have to have computers because so much, well, not only the virtual, but even before that, the schools were going to iPads and, and that use. And so it's looking at how, how we continue uh, to see the world develop, um, to get that world view. Um, but like you said, Corny, and, and both of you, that, that we, we remember what we're all about, that it is about our faith, that we have an impact on, on the people around us. You know, I always like to, to tell young moms, especially, you're the face of God to your children, whether you're loving and, and caring and forgiving, they're going to, that's how they are going to see God. Um, and well, so we have such an impact on each other. And, um, and so, um, yeah, it's been a, a gift to be with you today. I am going to ask Corny to share a beautiful prayer that, um, that he had with us, that he shared with us earlier. Thank you. So as we end this very prayerful moment, recognizing God's presence, we begin again in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we know you care for us. And you care for even the tiniest of details of all our days. 
May we not be too busy to notice, but then look back to see the treasure house that you have filled us with in our family. We do recognize also that you were there throughout. Never abandon us, never leave us. We thank you especially for those moments with family and for this moment where we get to share all of the generational family moments and events and people in our lives. We thank you especially for Cindy and for Kathy who put this together, but most importantly, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit for bringing us all together. We know them as God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you both so, so much. I look forward to when we can truly be together and uh, share I laughter too. and love. So I do too. I miss you and Joe. It was good to see you, Kathy. Give love to everybody. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.